so Onyx is some, where's Onyx? Right there, stand up. There's Onyx right there. Thank you, Onyx. Thank you. And thank you, everyone that serves on our build team. And uh, this is, uh, we're highlighting our build team this weekend. And if you would like to serve and you don't know how to get involved, um, just, um, I'll just give you Thomas Miller's cell phone personally. <laughs> and you can call Thomas and he'll help you get involved. And so, but just go to the website, I think might be the easiest way, huh? Okay. Thomas is shaking his head. Yeah, just go to the website. But we would love for you to serve. We couldn't do what we do without uh, you, all of you. And uh, some of you can't volunteer, but you can give or you can pray um, or you can do whatever God's called you to do. And so we appreciate that very, very much. I also just want to let you know, uh, I'm preaching the message, uh, the series, The Blessed Life. So we have the book, and, um, and then we also, this is a book on generosity that I was asked to write years ago. I told you a little bit about that. And then a few years ago, I wrote Beyond Blessed, which is about stewardship, because so many people want to give, they want to be generous, but they don't know how to manage their money. Uh, you know, we give them a course on how to drive a car. And we uh, teach all these different things, but we never teach anyone how to handle their money. And so this teaches you how to do it, but it also, I believe, it's, uh, it's written, the forward is written by Dave Ramsey, who's a good friend of mine, but it also hopefully gives you the motivation, not just how to do it. There are a lot of tools of how to do it, and of course, Dave has some of the best, but uh, this also might motivate you scripturally of why you need to manage your money. So... What we did was we put them, uh, if you want them here at Gateway at the bookstore, you can get both of them for $15. And so you can't get that anywhere else. So we're not trying to make money yet, obviously. We're trying to cover the costs of the books and then help you to be in your finances. And what I was thinking was, if you can't afford them, okay, uh, and I know that, I've been there before. If you can't afford them, go to the bookstore. So all the people that run the bookstores listen to what I'm saying and just put it on my account, okay? And I'll pay for it personally for you to be able to get a, both of the books, all right? And then I was thinking, well, you know what? Um, you, might, you might be able to afford more than that, and so you might say, hey, here's 15 bucks, and here's another $15, you know? So someone else can do it. And then I got to thinking about how I like to give $100 bills away. So, so Thomas, here, take this. And just give that the bookstore. So that is, how many is that? No, that's six. Six and two-thirds. Someone else needs to get five dollars, and that'll be seven books, right? Okay. So um, anyway, um, we, we took our Christmas family uh, picture. How many of you got get our Christmas card, you know? And so we had all of them together, and we were trying to get the grandchildren to smile. And so I just said... If all of you grandchildren, or nine of them, I said, if you'll smile, I'll give you $100. We have the biggest smiles <laughs> from our grandchildren. Then, then our grown children asked if I'd give them $100, and I said, no. Um, you make enough money, as you, do, you know, you, you can afford it. So, all right. So, I'm in this uh, series called The Blessed Life. It is my life message, and this is the most important message in the whole series. And I'm going to say something else that might shock you. This is the most important message that I preach. And the reason is I preach mainly to believers. So obviously if I were in a stadium in some third world country and I was preaching to people who didn't know Christ, obviously the most important message you can preach is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So I'm not taking away from that. But if you're a believer, the most important message that I could share with you, and it would be probably different for other pastors, but is the message I'm going to share today. If you catch this principle, it will change everything in your life. I promise you, okay? So I just wanted you to sense the importance of this message today. The, the title of the message is The Principle of the First. The Principle of the 
the first. And it runs all through Scripture. We're even going to go back to the Garden of Eden. So it's all through Scripture, right? So uh, here's the first principle. I'm going to show you some, some um, illustrations uh, of the principle of the first. Three illustrations by my points. And let me say this also. If God is first in your life, everything in your life will come into order. Everything. That doesn't mean you won't have tribulation because Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation. But then he said, but be excited about it or be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. It's okay. I've already taken care of this for you. But you will have tribulation. So I'm not saying you'll never go through a difficulty. I'm not saying that. But if God is not first in your life, then nothing will come into order in your life. And wouldn't you rather go through the tribulation that we're all going to go through as far as trials and difficulties and all the things we go through, wouldn't you rather go through any difficulty with God being first in your life <laughs> and everything in order in your life? So the only way to be, have everything in order is to have God first. So I want to show you three principles of the principle of the first, all right? So here's the first one, the principle of the firstborn. So this is a scripture from the Old Testament, but let me remind you that 1 Corinthians 10 says that everything that's written in the Old Testament was written for our instruction. So we need to learn from this. So some of the, this that I'm about to read you, you're going to think, it talks about a donkey and a lamb. And I don't know how many of you own a donkey and a lamb, okay? But there's a principle behind why God said it. And that's what we want to find out. So Exodus chapter 13, verse 1, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, consecrate. Now, here, the word consecrate simply means set apart or set aside to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, remember Romans 11 says we've been grafted in to the nation of Israel, if you believe in Jesus, all right? Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both the man and beast, now watch these three words, it is mine. In other words, set it aside because it belongs to me. So there's a principle here, and that's what I'm trying to get us to understand. Verse 12, you shall set apart to the Lord, set apart, same thing as consecrate, to the Lord, all that open the womb, that is every firstborn, this is the principle of the firstborn, that comes from an animal which you, which you have, the males shall be the Lord's, in other words, shall belong to God. But every firstborn of a donkey, and I'll explain all this in a moment, you shall redeem, that means buy it back so you can use it, with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, now watch this, then you shall break its neck. Now, I need to just mention here just for a moment this principle. This principle applies to tithing. And what he's saying is the first 10%, we're going to get to this, is set aside or set apart for me. But if you won't return it to the house of God, you're going to lose it anyway. <laughs> so you can bring it to the house of God and the 90% can be blessed or you can keep it in your bank account and it'll still go out of your bank account when your washing machine breaks or your car breaks or you lose your job. Please hear me, this is important. Wouldn't you rather return the first 10% to God and have all of your finances blessed or lose it anyway and have all of your finances cursed? I mean, you'd rather be blessed. There you go, you answer, I asked the question, you answered it, thank you very much. <laughs> I'd rather be blessed. <laughs> nah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple question, isn't it? All right, you shall set apart and then he says, and if you don't set it apart, you don't redeem it, you'll break its, you shall break its neck. In other words, you're going to lose it anyway. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. Okay, so here's what he's saying. There are two classifications of animals that he uses here. He uses a donkey and a lamb. 
A donkey represents unclean animals, and a lamb represents clean animals. Now, this was written 3,500 years ago. What in the world does that have to do with you if you're an accountant or a lawyer or in the medical profession or the education profession? Maybe you're a teacher. What, would, what does a donkey and a lamb have to do with you today? It's the principle behind it. And can I tell you, this principle is actually talking about, you ready for this? Jesus. That's how important what I just read you was. Let me, let me explain it to you. If, if you have an unclean animal, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean animal. And a clean firstborn, and remember Jesus is called the firstborn, has to be sacrificed. So a clean has to be sacrificed, but the unclean has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of the clean. Okay, so let's just for a moment, let's just figure out were you and I born Spiritually speaking now, clean or unclean? Unclean, because we were born with a sin nature. Would you like me to prove that to you? I'll just ask the experts here, the parents. <laughs> if you have children, let me ask you a question. Did you have to teach your children to be bad? No. Or did it come naturally for them? It came naturally, right? You had to teach them to be good. Why? Because they're born with a sin nature. So all of us were born unclean. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? Are you okay? You ready for this? And you better get excited over this or I'll get very upset with you. I might even cry, so you better get excited. Listen, this is what we just read. The clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. That's what we just read. That's how important that passage is. That's how important the firstborn is. And it's all through Scripture. Jesus said, if your sheep has, has a lamb, you bring the first one to me. And when you bring the first one to me, the rest are redeemed. They're blessed. They're brought out from under this curse of, that the world has on us. They're brought out from under. They're blessed. They're redeemed. The first one is the redemptive one. The first one redeems the rest. Here's the thing that you have to understand. If you, he didn't say, wait until you have 10 lambs and then give me one, and you can give me the one that you don't like that keeps getting in your garden every day. He said, give me the first one when you don't have the other nine. See, here's what it, 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 it this is the principle of faith. Because you have to give the first one before you have the other nine. Do you realize what tithing is? You don't pay all your bills and then tithe. You tithe first and then you pay your bills because it's faith. What God's trying to do is build faith in your life. Think about this. When they went into the promised land, God said, bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of the, of the Lord. Why did he say that? Because Jericho was the first city. <laughs> See, this is all through the Bible. He said, give me the first, and the rest are redeemed. And when they didn't bring all of the silver and the gold from Jericho into the, into the house of the Lord, they went to the second city, and they lost. And it was a very, very small city. They didn't even send their whole army. And God said, no. And here's what he said, by the way. He used the word that almost similar to the word we used last week. Remember last week he said, you're robbing me? You know what he used in Joshua 7? He said, Israel has stolen from me. Israel has taken what was consecrated 
are set apart to me. See, you have to, there are only two choices. Now, I'm going to say this very strongly, okay? And hopefully all of you love me to say, for me to say this strongly. You study the Bible yourself because I've been studying it 43 years. There are only, I've been studying this for 38 years. You, you, can, there, you only have two choices with the tithe, the first 10% of your income. You can bring it to the house of God or you can steal it. Just read it yourself. Those are the only two choices you have with the first 10% of your income. When um, uh, Ethan, my son-in-law, show up a picture here of Ethan Lane. If y'all don't know Ethan Lane, they pastor a church in uh, Katy. By the way, they started, uh, I guess, 2020, so it'd be a little over three years ago. They started, and five weeks later, obviously, the, the pandemic hit, and this past uh, weekend, Sunday, they had 1,900 in attendance. So they're doing pretty good. And, I mean, it's just incredible what they're doing. So anyway, so when Ethan and Elaine started dating, they were standing down here at the front. I don't know, James Lee, you might have even been there. I don't know because I know you were friends with them. But they were standing at the front because we had the young adult service in the sanctuary because we don't have a lot of, you know, we just built this building. We built a sanctuary and children's rooms. And by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about, we, we're in the process of talking about a wedding chapel. You know, we were talking about this in 2020, and we shut it down, and then we've, cur- we've, we've um, what's the word, trimmed it back, because we thought we don't need a gymnasium, and we don't need all that stuff, so, but we want to build a youth center for our young adults. We want to build a, uh, a wedding chapel. We want to build a studio, so everything we do, e- equipping classes, you can take them online. We want to do all that, so we'll, we'll talk to you about all that, you know, and, and here's the great thing. Uh, you just keep tithing. We got the money. We don't have to have a building campaign. Isn't that great? Wouldn't it be great if everybody just tithed? That's God's way of supporting the church. So anyway, Ethan Lane, we had the young adult service in here, and they had started dating. And so they got to joking around, seven or eight young people standing around talking, and they started joking with Ethan about what's it like to date the pastor's daughter. And I was very nice to Ethan, by the way. I was very nice. When he came over, you know, to talk to me about dating Elaine, I was very nice. I showed him my gun collection. And, um, you know, I was just, I showed him the animals on the wall, told him what a good shot I was. You know, just things like that. Anyway, so, but they were joking with him. And then one of them said to Elaine, you know, your dad is so uh, serious about the tithe I'll bet he even checks the tithing records of the guys that want to date you. And Elaine said, he does. <laughs> and Ethan said, went, uh-oh. And Elaine said, you told me you tithe. And he said, I do. He said, but there was one week, he said, I don't have internet. See, Ethan's also a real good steward. And the internet was so expensive. He said, I don't have internet because it's too expensive. So I go to Starbucks. I get paid every Friday. I go to Starbucks. I get online and I pay my tithe. And there was one Friday that I couldn't go. So I went on Saturday. So out of the last seven years, there's one day that I was late. And they all started laughing and said, oh, your dad's not going to notice one day and Elaine said, yes, he will. (laughs) And she said to Ethan, you better have an answer. So Ethan and I were talking because I told Ethan, you have to date me before you can date Elaine, you know. (laughs) And so we were talking a few, every week we had a date, we got together. And so anyway, we we were together. And so um, I said to him, I said, Ethan, there's something I want to ask you about. I said, four years ago in seven months, you were one day late <laughs> on your tithe. So anyway, <clears throat> hey, let me just say something, and I'm going to say it strong. Are you okay if I say something strong? Why would I give my daughter to a thief? I mean, if he'll rob from God, why would I give him the most precious thing, my family, 
that God's given me. Why? why? And, and by the way, if he can't handle money, he definitely can't handle Elaine. Because <laughs> <laughs> you've heard her preach. She's a handful, you know. She's, anyway. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's funny. Because James and Josh grew up in a different environment. You know, we, we didn't have the books and all that stuff. And Elaine, all of a sudden, you know, we were blessed tremendously financially. And uh, we've talked about that because James had one pair of shoes for golf, track, you know, dress, everything. It was one pair of shoes, you know. And Elaine, you know, had a lot more than they had growing up. And, uh, but Ethan, he was, he was a good steward. And he took them on one of their first dates. He took her to Wendy's. And she said, I'll have a key by this, and I'll have this, and I'll have this. And Ethan went, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> he said, we're not ordering from that menu. We're ordering from that menu. <laughs> How many of you know which one it was? The dollar menu. That's right. And a lady came home and said to me, did you know that Wendy's has a dollar menu? <laughs> and I said, yes, sugar, I order from it. She said, Ethan said, all the fast food restaurants have dollar menus. I said, I like this young man. <laughs> all right, here's the second principle, the principle of the first fruits. So there's a principle, the firstborn belongs to God. We're gonna get to tithing in a minute. The principle of the first fruits, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Look at this, honor the Lord with your possessions. Have you ever even seen that scripture? So how can you honor God with your car? It's really simple. Give him the first 10% of your income and then buy a car that you can afford. How do you honor the Lord with your house? Give him the first 10% of your income. And then, here's what's amazing. I hear testimonies all the time. We had this house and we went to buy it and they lowered it $25,000. We went to buy a car and they lowered the price. You can't believe what God does for tithers. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Now, he's speaking to farmers here, so you could, in, you could insert the word income where it says increase, okay? And you can tell he's speaking to farmers because watch. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Look at this, Exodus 23, 19, the first of the first fruits. He wants you to really understand what the word first means. The first of your first fruits of your land you shall bring, notice the word bring, into the house of the Lord your God. Did you see the word bring? Okay, do you know why he uses the word bring when he talks about tithing? He never uses the word give when he talks about tithing. He always uses the word bring. Here's the reason. You can't give what doesn't belong to you. You can only bring it to the house of God or you can steal it. That's your only choice. Um, when I was in uh, Bible college, one of the students asked one of the professors, why did God accept Abel's offering and he didn't accept Cain's offering? Isn't that a great question? And the professor, he was wonderful. He said, you know, I really don't know. I really, I've never gotten any revelation on that passage. And then years later, God showed me, and this has been like my, one of my, this has been my life message about the first, the principle of the first. And uh, God showed me the principle of the firstborn and the principle of the first fruits. Now I want to read you the story of Cain and Abel and watch how easy it is to, to see why God chose, why God accepted Abel's but not Cain's. Remember, firstborn and first fruits belong to God, all right? Watch it, Genesis 4, verse 3. And in the process of time, in the process of time, in other words, over time, it came to pass, it just kind of happened, that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Notice it does not say first fruits. Just oh, in the process of time, just whenever Cain wanted to, it just kind of happened that he brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord, not first fruits. 
Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. He didn't just respect his offering, he respected him. But he did not respect Cain and his offering. Is that clear? By the way, this is 2,500 years before the law. You want to explain that one to me? 2,500 years before the law, and the principle of the firstborn and first fruits was already enacted by God. Already. I mean, it's right there. Cain, here's another way to say it. And here's what Christians have told me. I give as I feel led. Not with the tithe you don't. Because that means that you think that that money is yours. It is the Lord's. It belongs to him. It's set apart. It's consecrated to him. We've already read that. You return it to the house of God. You bring it to the house of God. You don't give it to God. You bring it to the house of God. You return it to him. And so here's really what Cain did. He gave what he wanted when he wanted. Or as he felt led. Abel brought the firstborn. Now, it's not just, let me go go into a little theology for you if you don't mind, okay? It's not just that God would not accept Cain's offering. It's that God could not. There are some things that God cannot do. And I know everyone says, well, he's God, he can do anything he wants. No, he can't. He can never act outside of his character. For instance, God can't sin. God can't lie. He can't. Because he is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. I am the truth. So he can't lie. There are things God can't do. I'd love to, love to talk about this. Uh, here, here's one that God can't do. God can't change. This is called the immutability of God. The reason God can't change is because uh, if he could change, he could get better, and he's already best. So he can't change. Here's one. This will shock you. God can't think the way we think. Now, notice I clarified it, because the Bible does talk about his thoughts, okay? But God can't think the way we think. Here's the reason. We think to figure things out. When you couldn't go to sleep last night, and you were thinking about something, you were trying to figure it out. Okay, listen to me. God is not trying to figure out anything. This is called the omniscience of God. It comes from two words, omni and science. All, omni means all, science means knowledge. God has all knowledge. Here's something to think about. God knows everything at the same time. Let me say that again. God knows everything at the same time. Think about that this week, and you'll trip a breaker. (laughs) Are Are you catching me that God knows everything? Okay? All right, so let me just say it a little bit more, so you'll catch you a little bit more. Nothing has ever occurred to God. God has never said, you know what I just thought of? (laughs) I just thought of something I've never thought of before. It's never happened. Okay, so let me tell you, then this this is what relates to Cain. This is why he could not accept Cain's offering. God can never be second. He can't. This is called the preeminence of God. One of the best studies is to study the attributes of God. He's preeminent. That means he's first of all, higher than all, before all, and above all. So he can never be second. So when Abel brought a first offering, God said, I can accept that. When Cain did not bring a first offering, God said, I can't accept that. And it's all through Scripture. We, we could have kept reading in Malachi the other day where God said, you bring me the lame, the lame, the blind and the maimed as your offerings. And then he says this, I do not accept them. Can you imagine bringing God second best? He's not going to accept it. All right, so here's the third one, the principle of the first 
10%. This is all through Scripture. The reason it's first is if it belongs to God, it has to be first. We saw the firstborn belonged to God. We saw the first fruits belonged to God. They were consecrated for the house of God. All right, here's the tithe, the first 10% of your increase. Watch this. Very simple. It's going to be very clear. It belongs to God. Leviticus 2730, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. Belongs to God. It is holy, which again means set apart to the Lord. Now, I just, I, I have to show you something about the tithe. Remember I told you last week that the tithe could be more personal to Jesus than what you think? It also might be more personal to the Father than what you think because it represents Jesus. All right, who, so we talked about the firstborn belongs to God. Colossians 1.15, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. All right, we talked about first fruits, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, you want me to tell you something really incredible? Jesus is God's tithe. You want to know why? Because you give the tithe first. You don't wait to see if you have enough after paying your bills. You don't wait to see if your sheep has 10 lambs. You give the first one. Okay. God gave Jesus before we straightened up. God gave Jesus while we were, while we were spitting on him, mocking him, scourging him, and nailing him to a cross. And you will see the scripture, Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans also tells us that God gave Jesus in hope, and that's the same root word for faith, in hope that we would accept him. <laughs> see, this whole tithing thing is a whole lot more personal to God. All right, so how does this work out, the first 10%? So I'm going to have to give you a math illustration, okay? All right? So half of you can take a nap, all right? Um, you know, um, I've told you before, I love math. Debbie doesn't love, love math. She hates math um, with a passion. Um, by the way, uh, uh, this past Friday was Debbie's birthday, just so you know. So. And she, as you can put it out, she is the best-looking 39-year-old you'll ever see. And we've been married 43 years now, so. <laughs> but, um, so Debbie and I were buying something one time that was $7.99. Okay, my father is a mathematical expert. James is a mathematical expert. Literally, their IQ is um, in the 160s and 180s when it comes to math. So they're brilliant when it comes to math. Mine's in the 140s, by the way, when it comes to math. All right. My actually overall one, yeah, never mind. We don't, it doesn't matter. My, I'll tell you, my overall IQ, they say 140 and above is a genius. I'm a 139. <laughs> then I decided to take it again when I got older. I thought, well, hey, you know, I'm, I, I, maybe, maybe, it, maybe I'm a genius now. Maybe I went up one point. I took it again, 131. So I'm getting dumber as I get older. Okay. All right. So anyway, but the two of them, they're geniuses in math. They literally are geniuses. It's, it's proven. Um, but apparently it skips a generation. But uh, numbers add up in my mind without me trying to get them to. I mean, they just do that. They just do it. It's just, it's automatic. And so Debbie and I were buying something one time. It was $7.99. And the lady said, I'll have to add the, the tax on the uh, calculator because the cash register is broken. And I said, it's 66 cents, just like that. Uh, and she looked at me for a moment, and then she, <laughs> it's 66 cents. <laughs> and I didn't say anything. I just said, okay. We got out to the car, and this was when I was in my 20s, by the way, okay? So you got to remember, when you're in your 20s, you're pretty stupid, okay, when it comes to marriage, okay? So... I, uh, we got out of the car, and Debbie said to me, how do you do that? Well, I thought, 
that she was actually asking me <laughs> how I did it. And so, as an idiot, I said to her, well, sugar, uh, seven ninety nine is close to eight. Our tax rate is eight point two five. Eight times eight is sixty four. Quarter of eight is two. Sixty four plus two is sixty six. And then I said, that should happen in less than a second in your mind. <laughs> yeah. And she said to me, it doesn't. <laughs> and then she said but I know what 25% off means. <laughs> and so I thought we were still talking math. So I said, okay, if you're buying something for $100 and it's 25% off, what does that mean? She said, it means it's a good deal. <laughs> and then she said, follow this if you're a mathematician. Then she said, and if it's 50% off, it's free. What? And then she went like this. <sighs> like, I'm the one that doesn't understand math. <laughs> she said, Robert, everyone knows if it's 50% off, it's the same thing as buy one, get one free. So if it's 50% off, it's free. And then she said, and if it's 75% off, you're making money. which explains the statement to me. Have you ever heard this one? I made us money today. <laughs> Yet our bank account went down. <laughs> okay, so let me give you a math illustration, all right? All right, just stay with me, it won't be long, okay? For those of you that hate math like Debbie does, okay? All right, so if you were a landscaper and you came over to my house and you said, I said, I want trees and shrubs and flowers, and I want them here and there and here and da da You said, okay, Pastor Robert, this is how much the, the materials will cost. This is how much the labor will be, and my profit will be $1,000. Is that okay with you? And I say, yes, I agree to the total price. So at the end of the job, I pay for your materials, I pay for your expenses, and then for your, your labor, and then for your profit, I give you 10 $100 bills, okay? Because you tithe on your increase, not all of that, because you didn't increase on that, okay? So you only tithe on your increase. So, and so now, here's what I want to ask you. Here's the math part, okay? So some of you don't have to answer if you don't want to, okay? So you have 10 $100 bills in your hand, and the tithe is one-tenth, okay? So, two questions. First of all, how much is the tithe? $100. <laughs> it's funny to watch some of your faces. <laughs> all right. And that's okay, because you're good in subjects I'm not good in, okay? All right. So, all right, but it's $100, okay? But here's the second question. Which one is the tithe? Well, yes, we're saying the first one, because we, we're talking about a message about the first but how do you know which one's the first one? Listen, it's the first one to leave your hand. In other words, if you go home and you say, let me set aside some for the mortgage, let me set aside some for the car, let me set aside some for clothes and food, and here's God por God's portion. That's not God's portion. You gave God's portion to the mortgage company. And the mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. But God does. And what a lot of people do is say, here's some for this, here's some for this, here's some for this. And then they say, oh no, there's not enough left over for God. Can I just let you know he wouldn't accept it anyway? And he couldn't accept it because he's first. Okay, so let me read you one more passage and then we're finished. Remember back at Exodus 13, we talked about this principle of the firstborn we stopped at verse 13. Verse 14 says, So it shall be when your son asks you, 
in time to come saying, what is this? In other words, one day your son's going to get old enough to want to know why you're killing these lambs. That you shall say to him, here's your answer, by strength of hand, one version says, by a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, this is the reason I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Okay, so here's what he, he, he explained to him. Here's how you tell your children why you do this. One day, your son's going to say to you, you know, Dad, you told me, asked me to take over the books. And, um, Dad, um, you might not even know you do this. You know, we all have blind spots. But um, what I noticed was when I was looking over the books that every time one of our animals has a firstborn, you, um, how shall I say this, uh, kill it. And I was just wondering, uh, you killed 72 animals last year, and we're in the ranching business. So I was just wondering why you were doing that. And God said, you say to your son, son, it's time for you to know. There's something about our family that you don't know. We were not always ranchers. We didn't own any animals. We didn't even own land. Son, we were enslaved people. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed us and gave us all that we have now. Therefore, we gladly give to God the first of all of our increase. Now, this was written 3,500 years ago. I had this happen with Josh, my oldest, my firstborn, and with James. Both of them this happened to. And then I taught Elaine about it one day. I called her in to, to teach her this. But one day, Josh walks into my office, and here's what I used to do years ago. And so he was just a young man, like 9, 10 years old. I would write the tithe check and set it over to the side and then I would pay all the bills. But I'd always write the tithe check first and then take it to church on that Sunday. And so, oh, I was just thinking, uh, for some of you younger people, we used to have pieces of paper called <laughs> checks. We, we didn't take our phone and go, Hoo, like that, okay? <laughs> all right. So anyway, so the tithe check is sitting over here, and I'm paying the bills, and Josh came in, and he saw it, and he said, Dad, why are you giving so much money to the church? And I took my son, and I did it with James as well, and I put him in my lap, and I said, Son, it's time for you to know something about our family that you don't know. But daddy wasn't always a Christian. And your daddy used to be a very, very bad man. And I couldn't stop being bad. But God with a mighty hand redeemed your daddy and gave him everything that we have now. Therefore, I gladly give to God the first of all of my increase. And all three of our kids and obviously their spouses tithe. And that's worse every dollar that I've given to the church.
I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit, like we do every weekend, what are you saying to me through this message? Just ask him. And listen, I know that some of you have wanted to tithe and tried, and it's been really tough. I understand that. I want to say what I said last weekend. You're not a bad person. You don't love Jesus less. Don't let the devil condemn you. You're a good person. You love God, but you might need some help. You might, you might need the book, The Blessed Life. You might need the book, Beyond Blessed. You might need to contact our stewardship ministries. You might just need some help, but you're not a bad person. But I'm begging you, I'm begging you with all of my heart to stop looking at this as something legalistic and understand that this is a principle that runs all through Scripture and it's called the principle of the first. Put God first in every area of your life, including your finances. And watch what God can do when He's first. We want to pray with you. If you have any need at all, and it might not even be in the finances, but you might need some prayer in this area. At every campus, we'll have people at the front. And in just a moment, we're going to give you a chance. And you're not a bad person when you come for prayer. I asked for prayer right before this service. I asked friends to gather around me and to pray. So we all need prayer. All of us, I need prayer. So if you need prayer for any area in just a moment, we're going to tell you how you can get prayer today. Don't ever come to church with a prayer need and leave and not get prayer, okay? Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you that you put us first. You gave us your best before we believed, while we were yet sinners. Christ, the firstborn and the firstfruits, died for us. And we thank you. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who struggle in this area. And I want to say again, they're wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people. And they love you with all of their heart. This just could be an area they struggle in. I pray today will be a breakthrough. Please, God, let this be a breakthrough. I, I take authority. I feel like I just take authority over Satan in Jesus' name, and I rebuke you from coming against my brothers and sisters in the area of putting God first in their finances. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask you to open the windows of heaven over them and bless them with the knowledge and the revelation and the wisdom and the faith to walk in this principle. And I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys so much. Amen. You can go to remain seated. Like Pastor Robert was saying, we're going to go into a time of prayer. And here's why that's important is because prayer is a value of this house. Gateway Church is a house of prayer. And like I said, we never want to give anyone, uh, never want anyone to miss an opportunity to receive prayer. So if you don't have to leave, here's what we ask. We ask that you stay and partner with us and be praying right now for those that are gonna get ready to come forward and receive prayer. You can go ahead and stand and I wanna invite our prayer team up to the front right now. These are incredible men and women who would love to stand with you in prayer. Who, whatever, whatever it is your prayer need is, there's nothing too big or nothing too small. Our team is here and we would be honored to stand with you and to pray with you. Like Pastor Robert says, uh, we all need prayer. You don't have to be a member of Gateway Church to receive prayer. We all need prayer. There's people over, up in the balcony uh, as well, so that way you don't have to come all the way down here. They will be able to receive you up in the balcony and pray for you there. But we will not leave unless ev until every prayer need is met. And so there's incredible ministry that is taking place here. So for those of you who are saying, be praying right now that God continues to meet people here at the altar.
A few things before you go. I want to I want to let you know that next week is our night of worship. Uh, next Sunday night is our night of worship, and it's an incredible time. We get to gather as a community, gather as a church, and have a powerful time of worship. You don't want to miss it. I will say this: it won't be the same without you here. Uh, the, these nights of worships are incredible times for us to to gather to worship our King and to be in community. Um, Austin Benjamin, who's our worship leader here, has an incredible night planned, and I can't wait for you to be a part of it. Also, uh, we've been honoring our build team. It is a build team weekend, like, you, like we said. And Sunday night, we're going to be honoring our build team with a big party to celebrate and honor them for all that they do. If you're a part of our build team, we invite you to go ahead and register to be a part of that. But here's the thing. If you're interested in becoming part of our build team, if you're interested in, in, in getting connected and being a part of this build team family and helping Gateway Church feel more like family for, for everyone who enters these doors, we, we're going to invite you out to that as well. We want to honor our build team and celebrate them and we want to let you know what it's like to be a part of this community and be part of this family so that's tomorrow night at 6 p.m you can go ahead and register right there and uh, and get all the information that you would need for that night but we would hope to see you there like i said it's going to be an incredible time uh, and we'd love for you to be there also we have the gateway church uh we've got the musical that takes place every holiday season how many have been to this uh gateway production that we do every every christmas uh well it takes an army to put that phenomenal, phenomenal production on. And so if you have the talent in here of, of singing or dancing or acting, we would love for you to be a part. Uh, now, it's not whether or not you think you sing well in the car, because I think I sing well in the car. Like Austin Benjamin has a voice like an angel. That is not myself. That is not my gifting. But if you have that gifting, if you have that anointing, we would love for you to audition. Auditions take place this week. So you can go to gatewayperformingarts.com and it's going to give you all the information there. Maybe you don't sing or act or dance, but you still want to be involved and you still want to serve. Like I said, it takes an army to put on this production. So you can serve behind the scenes in costumes and props, all the different areas that you can serve in. Go to gatewayperformingarts.com for all that information. Gateway Church, you're the best church in the world. I love you so much. Let me pray for you and then we can, we can be dismissed. God, I thank you for the people in this room. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the ministry that is taking place here at the front. God, God, I thank you that your presence is here. I uh, thank you that our tomorrow morning will look different because of the word that you have given Pastor Robert to speak directly into our hearts, God. God, we honor you and we praise you. And in your resurrected name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Gateway Church, we love you so much. We'll see you next week.